managing loss. Explain that. Um, what are your big losses? My dad is a, a really great guy, but every parent is, you know, you as a kid, you you your folks doing their very best they can do are doing damage that they don't understand, mm-hmm. and, and that's just what every parent does, and it's it's not their fault and it's not yours either. It's just this is the traverse of life. Yeah, and and my dad's always been a workaholic, and so working and and he's always been like. Uh, he has such a great moral compass, you know, like we should do what's right. And all I got from that was like, set aside how you feel and get involved in doing what the situation asks for to make the situation right as a, yeah. as a whole. And then we'll deal with your emotions later. That's, that's what I got from that, you know? Yeah. And if uh, at all, maybe yeah. later, maybe we'll forget. Well, and I, I think you just sort of start frisbing them into a pile on the mm-hmm. back burner. And I um, was very close with my grandparents that are tattooed in my hands. And it's, it was very close. And, and when they'd pass and they passed, you know, it was like, there's things to do. We need to, you know, I never registered or any grief there because it was another frisbee on the pile, you know. And, and um, put your head down and work. And when you don't know what to do, if you've got so many problems, help someone else with theirs. That's, you know, uh, put your head down and go. And so I just did that. And I think Speed really helped me to do that. Again, Speed, thank you. You know, <laughs> brought to you by. Brought to you by. <laughs> snore, snore, well, snore, and, snore, and snore. in the last seven years or so, sort of starting with with Tony Bourdain, who's, it just got me, that <laughs> got me good, you know. And and I. Close friend? A good buddy. Yeah. And and, uh, and Eagles Death Metal got attacked at the Bataclan. Mm-hmm. And there was a lot of people there that was so much like two phones talking to the FBI and the, the you know, the special force of France to get people home. And just, it was just like, there was no time to, to sort of, uh, get your head around what was going on, you know, cause there was so much work to be done. Right. And it was important. And also protecting everyone that was, that made it, you know, too, yeah. from the world, from this, you know, geopolitical mind fuck mm-hmm. for a rock band to be. yeah it's like you know and uh as a musician we we die young so it's like then all of a sudden whether it's taylor or mark lanigan who used to sing with us and uh, my best friend rio hackford was, it's just the best person it's just too young at 52 to the two little ones you know and, and uh, um and you realize like hey, hitler had to kill himself that guy was a total asshole it's like you have people that would switch Really, this guy had to kill himself, and and you're gone, and you know, the frustration and the, um, the sort of pushing unfairness. It to, yeah, the unfairness and the, you know, those those stages of grief where you're bargaining like, what can I do? There must be something I can do. There's got to be a way. I've thought my my way out of and into things. That there must be a way. This I've never learned so much as I have in the last five years. You know. And everyone went through so much. And I, I too went through a lot of stuff. It really took till the last year or so to just get to the acceptance part. Did you take time off? Yeah, I took a lot of grief. I chose to in the last five years in particular, which I suppose had a certain level of convenience because the world was, was. We all did. Yeah. And, and so it, it somehow aligned with that. Yeah, but it also left everyone, and certainly me, choiceless. It was time to sit in it. Mm. There was nowhere to to go. Yep. You know, I've always been into big change, but I've always been the agent of that big change so much of the time. And this was big change that that kept happening where it doesn't well, matter. The, uh, and are you changing? Or are you administering change? Yeah. Well, I think when ones. you're administrating, you think you you think that you're you're changing, but really you're sort of moving geographical locations or mental geography mm-hmm. and and thinking that's a grand change and it's like no you're about to reveal yourself to a bunch of new people or something yeah. akin to that you know yeah but this was different because it was all, all these situations where essentially it doesn't matter if you like it or not this is here and there's nothing you can do about it and so you can have as many wishes as you want or as many bargaining chips as you want but they're of no use here now and so that just takes first admitting the reality of where you're, where you're at, you know? And, and, you know, I have, I have three little ones and, and I just, they're my, they're my favorite thing. And so being around them and 
seeing that life cycle in someone small that lives in your house, the short people that live in my house, mm -hmm. and and people who I wish so desperately were still here, and they're just not. And it took, I mean, it was a lot of work in the last five years. And just sitting, sitting in it. Sitting in it. Did you write about it? Did you think about it? Did you, how did you process it? I tried, I did a little bit of this EMDR stuff, mm -hmm. which I actually quite liked. Yeah, it's great. Because it, it had actually some data backing up about it's, what I get to do. reality. Mm -hmm. I, I somehow feel like I need, it can't just be, like I said, I romanticize my ideals. I want to take a leap of faith, but it can't just be mumbo jumbo. Yeah. Because then I just feel duped. Like I, well, yeah. Like it's, I bought the elixir work, from a carnival bar. What did you think? And if it does work, you can't, you'd never Compared believe that Compared to it what? Yeah, yeah, like uh, there's no reference point for yeah. that. I really, I enjoyed the MDR. And I, and I think really because I couldn't write about it and I couldn't start playing because I was just too... Do you journal anything like that? I, I, I do. I, well, I write, and, I, and, I, and my notebooks are a bit journal, a bit, um, you know, complain board, uh -huh. <laughs> a bit appreciation station, yeah. and a bit poetry, mm -hmm. and a bit re remembering stories, and, 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 and hoping for future ones, you know? And so they're a real mission. Well, tell me, what do you mean by remembering stories? Well, sometimes, you know... If I have a memory, I, I'm not much for nostalgia because it kind of makes me feel bad so for some reason. <laughs> it's like I look back and I and I tend to remember only the good stuff, and I so I'm like, oh, oh, yeah. And I think that's part of what I've had to learn to deal with in managing loss, is that it's okay to. That's all I've got of lots of these people now is memories. So if I'm not willing to be nostalgic, then I'm icing out these people that I love, you know. And I also learn like I, I can still love them. Now, you know, I don't have to stop loving someone because they're not here, and 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 in that way, I guess I, it makes me feel good because it makes me feel like I'm sort of celebrating what I knew, you know, about them, you know. So you will write a memory, yeah, in your journal, yeah, of like the time me and Tony or me and Taylor, me, and yeah, me and Re like and. Especially when they're brutal. <laughs> like I said before, I, I just love willful stupidity because we're agreeing, like, let's do this. Yeah. Let's jean shorts, everyone, let's rock. <laughs> you know? And and I so I, you know, a stupid walk through New Orleans with Rio, you yeah. know. Uh on a night that should be forgotten. And it's like, no, 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 no. I'm just gonna admit that instead. And I won't and I, and instead I won't forget that, you know. Like we did something regrettable, lamentable, yeah. but we did it, and I can't pretend we didn't. And yeah, it's just and I'm so glad the police were cool. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that would be a good name for your memoir. <laughs> <laughs> What's the, your Wikipedia entry? I know that you have two and a half. I did the two point uh, two five special on Netflix. Uh huh. Uh, what's the Wikipedia in terms of like she's the youngest of da 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 da. Oh, I'm the oldest of four. Okay. Yeah. So you and, think I wouldn't need more attention, but apparently control um, issues. Uh, <laughs> people hate control issues except for airline pilots and surgeons. <laughs> you guys go ahead. Um, your mother died. That's that's yes. the significant thing I was looking for. Oh, yeah. So I'm we were sorry. looking for mother died. Sorry. Oldest of four, dead mom. <laughs> she died when you were how old? Eight. I watched it on the Jay Shetty podcast. That guy's gorgeous. Oh, my God. Of course. Yeah. Um, and so I watched it on mute. I don't even know what you said. Um, <laughs> and I skipped your parts. Fuck. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, sorry. I always think it's bullshit when people go, that's the most significant moment of my life. You kind of go, you don't know what the most significant moment of your life was. That's pretty fair and square, the most significant moment of your yeah, life. Yeah, I feel confident saying that. I mean, it was the most formative for sure, yeah. I think. And I don't, I don't think I realized that until the last few years of my life because I think my early 20s I was like you're fine now like you we get it it happened you're good and then it just comes in waves you know grief isn't linear and all the things people say are true like I realized I know that if I listened to Jay Shetty not on mute I know right <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would have heard that by now well because even as I as my career started going better I was like I had people saying like oh your mom would have been so proud and I'm like I don't know that I would have been doing this if my mom was alive that's a funny 
and potentially true thing. What were you like before she died? Do you remember? Uh, I mean, I was seven. No, but that's what I I'm saying. Like, do you remember? Do you remember any traces of a personality? I don't remember being anxious, and I don't remember having nightmares really. And I started having really bad nightmares after she died. Why? I'm kidding. I know, right? Um, <laughs> ugh, why though? <laughs> Um, I don't understand. Or maybe you're, you maybe, think there was a connection? Maybe you're lactose intolerant. I am actually. So, oh, great, you know, great, great. it's, yeah. a, maybe it's you a real need to toss. Change your diet. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, changed my answer. That's the most significant. Yeah, it's the lactose. It's the um, lactose. Because I remember being kind of funny before before I was eight. I don't you remember. You know what I mean? I don't remember being funny before you know, I was eight. So you think that it's a comedy as a nervous tick, potentially? I don't know. From what I, I've been told by like my grandparents, I was unintentionally funny when I was a kid. I was like a kid who took themselves really seriously, and that's hilarious when you're right. four. So I don't really remember being funny or trying to be funny before that. But you're so young, so how do you know? So a lot of it is not a direct response, but kind of a direct response to like a new life situation, a new emotional situation, and like a, just like that. Now I'm this. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I think maybe, but I also became way more anxious because of it. Like, so terrified all the time of everything because you can't tell yourself, like, that's probably not going to happen or that type of thing doesn't happen because you go, no, it did happen. Yeah, the worst thing just, happened. The so worst like, thing happened. A kind of bad thing could very easily happen. Yeah, so it's all on the table Yeah. now, forever. Yeah. it Well, it opened you up to possibilities. Oh, yeah. Oh, you could yeah. guess and... <laughs> Uh, way better because anything you're it really expanded your horizons of yes. your parameters of reality <laughs> um, comedy has been explained as most of us have kind of a remote or sad mom mm. most people in comedy mine's very remote I mean fucking talk the about distance. it just give us <laughs> any sort of sign um, hello where's your dad oh he passed away a few years ago oh glad I asked yeah um, were the parents gonna be a block right still here. married? That'd be a really quick block. Were they married? Yeah, yeah. And what kind of person was he? He had a temper, but he was a very, um, a uh, very gregarious guy in amongst uh family and friends. So he would come in the room, and everyone would be like, he he would he would be the center of t attention in the room. He could always hold the room, always had jokes, um, and uh, he very uh fo focused guy on education. So he would help his entire family in Malaysia, he would be the guy who'd be like, you got to go here and study. You have to go to KL. He, to the point where he would force some of my cousins, like his nieces and nephews, he would force them into the car to go to the city to study. Because he'd be like, you need to learn accounting so that you'll have a future. He was the guy who was like the, and he wasn't even the oldest in the family, you know, he was considered the younger brother. And he was well educated? He, um, he got his master's, but he got it late in life. Which is why I had, I, I came to America because he, um, had two kids, his business failed, and then he he decided to go to college with two kids to kind of re retrain himself. And then he it. became an executive. When he went back to Singapore, he became like a... It, because in the, in the early 90s, that was the last time when an overseas education was was quite impressive. Kind of, and, now then everyone has it. and then it just... It, everyone started doing it? Yeah, so everyone like kind of has it. It's still, you know, kind of impressive, but not everyone has it, you know, so it's a bit less, like, of a wild thing. But that, I think he caught that tail end of the, oh, you, study, you study overseas? Oh, wow. That, that, that kind of thing. And he was also a smart guy. So he, you know... And uh, were you cool, tight with him? How would you Yeah, we were cool. I, I don't think we were best friends, but I think we were cool, especially especially towards the end. You know, I think he uh, he passed away very suddenly, so we never got to say goodbye or anything. How did he, which how, what happened? Uh, he was working on his farm, and he, that was, uh, yeah, he he, uh, he passed away on the farm. Yeah. What kind of farm was it? It's not like the uh, old McDonald's farm. It, it's like a Malaysian Johor Bahru farm. So it's not like, it's not, barns and horses it's like the tropics there's oil palms there's bananas there's uh rubber tap so it's like a so it's like gr a brutal yeah it's pretty brutal yeah but he loved it he loved it he, How, was he always doing that he, he grew up doing that he grew up being a his family was rubber tappers in malaysia which rubber in malaysia was like white gold back yeah. in the day it's like that was if you could tap rubber it was unbelievable especially if you own the uh, your own rubber trees 
Um, and so he grew up doing that, but he was like the guy in the family who went to school. He's probably the best educator in his family. Maybe, 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 oh, maybe two other aunties, but he was kind of like the, the academic one. And so he left that to go to the executive life and business and executive. He kind of left farming. Right. And then when he got older, he, he got retrenched and he just decided to go back to farming. Like something in him was like, I need to go back to farming. He, so he did it very happily. And I got to say, the farming helped him mentally and physically so much. Even though it was like a brutal farm, he just loved it, you know? He just loved it. And did His you, farm was like our stage time. It was like, yeah. he just felt alive in that farm. In yeah. What way is he similar to him? What way is he different? I think apparently we, we talk the same and we're very uh, straight shooters and we're both, we can both be the life of the party and also the grumpiest at the party, which was, that was probably him. And, um, uh, and he would always have the, he would always tell people how they should be better in their lives. Like you should go and do this. And that's a dumb idea. And that, you know, and I think I, I got a lot of that from him just being. I think I got a lot of that from him as well. <laughs> he would come in and be like, you should be studying accounting. And it's like, that's a dumb business idea. You should. <laughs> he, he was like a, the ultimate management consultant. He he's would come not, in I'm and he I'm going to be would, honest with you, he sounds white. Sounds like a white guy. <laughs> hey man, hey, pe to white people don't know this. In Asia, there's people who are like that in Asia. Who there are, are white, like white, they're white Asian. <laughs> white hearted Asian. Um, but I'm that's sorry what's astounding. he died. And how oh. did, are you aware of how that affected you? Do you think about it? I, I think I'm still dealing with it. Yeah. Yeah, he passed away very suddenly, uh, uh, very unexpectedly as well on, on Christmas Day. Which probably is also why I don't like celebrating Christmas anymore. I don't. But, I don't um, know. But I don't know if I see any <laughs> correlation there. Oh. And and uh, yeah, I you know, I never got to say bye to him. And it was it was uh, he visited me in New York just before he passed away for the the only time. What ever. year? This was like twenty seventeen, maybe. He so you're on the Daily him. Show. I'm on the Daily Show. He came. Yeah, he saw it. Um, he was pretty psyched to be back in America because he went to college in America, but he hadn't been back since. So. His thing was, I just want to go have a Dunkin' Donuts. He was like craving Dunkin' Donuts. So we just brought him to Dunkin' Donuts in New York. And I think he had a good time in New York City. He's white. He's white. <laughs> yeah, man. And uh, the last time I saw him was at Terminal 8 at JFK. That was when he was waving by to go mm. back to Singapore. So every time I fly out there, it's fucking brutal. It's I bet. Like, yeah, it's like, oh, damn, that's the last time. Literally, that TSA line is the last time I saw him. That's the American terminal. Yeah. Okay, American well. Airlines. I know that terminal well. <laughs> yeah, Terminal 8. So it's um, brutal, yeah. Lots yeah. of brutal stuff. When he passed away, we had to go and figure out his affairs. Yeah, like his, you and your mom. His legal matters because he left so suddenly. It's very, it's, it's very weird. He was so old school. He left all his, um, he left all his uh, uh, documents on his kitchen table. So we were able to go through it. Paper, print it out. So he, had, like, he left it there like four How stacks. often would he do it? I think Would that's just how it? he did business. I think that's just how he did it because he's, he was old school in that yeah. way. So he printed it out. Um, but yeah, when we, we come in his stack, he had four stacks of folders and we had to go through each stack to figure out what he was doing. You know, it wasn't, wasn't anything shady. It was just like, we had no idea what his, what his yeah. farming was like. And my, my brother-in-law is a forensic accountant. So that helped. <laughs> that's fine. And my wife is nice. a lawyer. And so uh, it was like, it was like the, if there was any team that was able to crack this this case, it was us, and so we just went through it for like a week. And man, it was brutal. It was brutal looking through all his stuff, his old handwritten notes. You know, yeah, it must have been heartbreaking. Yeah, yeah. And it uh, must also be, if you don't mind me saying, like, kind of surreal. Yeah. Where you're, where you're like, did that happen? Yeah, yeah. It was surreal. It is surreal. Yeah. I mean, you know, your your father passed away in a hospital, and you you said goodbye to you him. were there you know yeah i know uh, uh you or at least you tried to say goodbye yeah. to him yeah uh yeah and so you know people leave suddenly like that and then you're like oh what? you know and then you you see ghosts of their life everywhere you know even just last christmas uh just a month ago i had to go back to malaysia to finally settle some of his estate um matters because of the pandemic i haven't been able to go back to malaysia so we were back in his hometown i had to go to his hometown which he brought us to as it's a funny because on Instagram it's just I'm in Malaysia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. then it's like, oh no, no, no. no. I'm I'm like I'm doing going through an indie stuff. movie right now. Yeah. This is an indie road trip movie. Me, my mom, my sister, and we had to go back to his hometown and 
you know, meet with a lawyer to sign stuff and and and, and figure out his rubber farm. Yeah, sounds like a, a four thousand year old job, <laughs> right? And then go and see all the family stuff, you know, where he grew up because he had a big family, so all his family is very welcoming. You know, my dad's side always very cool, cool to us, like love them a lot. So we have to meet up with all of them, and you know, but he's yeah, I'm sorry that and, I'm sorry that it it I'm sorry that that's I mean we all have to deal with it, but yeah. that's seems like zero prep yeah and yeah. zero and we, we and want, it's like is it hard to know what lesson to draw from it like what am i supposed to think like you know yeah. what I mean? maybe I mean, you don't not, think not everything is a lesson i guess but uh i think uh yeah the obvious stuff right make peace with people when you can make sure your i would say make make your parents uh have a practical document of where they keep everything in case anything happens you don't have to be trying to go through it like a forensic accountant trying to figure out what's going on so at least they have that some they, you know they don't even need to show you just have a practical document in addition to your wills legal will you have a practical document of like i have cash in the under my pillow here and like leave a, it on the kitchen table <laughs> leave it somewhere leave it somewhere people can find it your passwords you know or you know delete destroy my laptop whatever your you know whatever, <laughs> whatever your, your masturbation yeah is. whatever the thing is um yeah and uh like um what's the lesson from that i don't know i think uh, that uh you know we me and my dad went through our went through our rough patches i think and we want like best friends but we want enemies you know right well and i think we definitely loved hard, each other yeah, yeah that's the other hard thing is like he dies suddenly yeah and you go man i wish i'd been closer with him but not because he died suddenly, because who wouldn't want to be closer with their dad? Yeah. Right? And also you go like, man, could I have been closer right. with him? You know, things played out the way they played out, right? Like, how could I? Yeah. Uh, you like, what else could I have done? What, you know, in some ways, what different, maybe we're two similar personalities that we couldn't be friends or whatever it was. But like, you still love each other a lot, you know? Right. Yeah, you don't have to be. In fact, the idea of being friends with your parents is not even an Asian thing to be I'm uh, with you 100%. My parents, my dad's dead. He's pretty old. Yeah. I very old. About as old as you can get was dead. Right. And uh my mom's 88. Right. My mom's still like an authority figure to me. Right, 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 right. And it's, yeah. I don't like chill around authority figures, yeah. you know, like right. you're very anti-authority in anything. You're kind of hello. a little bit, yeah. <laughs> um but that's the like with your dad where it's it's some people there's almost like structural tension. Yeah. Like he's your dad. He's an authority. Yeah. So how cool could it have been and how, how cool it could have been exactly exactly but i hope i mean i it sounds like you may have like not beat yourself up about it but sort of question your own behavior within it and i don't know some yeah. of it's just personality based yeah i don't i you know i i think i'm lucky in a sense that i don't think i obviously you know looking back at your last whatsapp chats with your dad you go like oh man i wish i said something more than you know then I don't know where to buy this drone, Dad. You know, like that's what he asked us. He was like, "Hey, should I buy a drone for the farm?" I'm like, "I don't think you should buy a drone." That's not, like, you know, the worst last conversation you can have with someone. Else. I bet it meant a lot. <laughs> but uh, so you re you kind of like wish you could say stuff, you know? But 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 I, you don't know. Well, I mean, exactly. we're all just surviving. You yeah, know I mean? we're all just like, we, I gotta go. I mean, it's a good ca it's a good case for putting sugar in everything. Yes. It's a good <laughs> Yes, exactly. It's a good tone. It's a good thing to fix that block. But it's very, a lot, uh, you know, life is uh, busy and messy and a lot of just like tedious and right. we're not always, right? you know, like at least you had a relationship with them and you told them yeah. that getting and, a drone for a farm is not a good idea. And, you know, not for nothing, but he, he got to see me go on, go, go on the Daily Show. He got to see that I wasn't, you know, like struggling in America, you know. Did you do a chat when he was there? A chat is the so. thing when you sit at the table with I Trevor. I think so. But, but the, the the thing at the I always love love Franco for this because Franco at the Daily Show, the the sexy saxophone uh camera guy, he he um he he had the conversation with my dad in the hallway and Franco so so nice he was like, Your son is great. Your son is one of the great things. And so like I, I guess all parents, but especially like Chinese parents, like you're not good until some third party says oh this guy's good and then they're like oh man my son is good you know so so That's I, funny so he kind of walked away from that being like oh man they really like you on the show man i'm like oh yeah yeah I hope yeah so. it's yeah. funny and franco <laughs> could have just been bullshit it's a funny like 
There should be a service where you can talk to Asian parents, uh, <laughs> where you can hire. A, I just want to tell person. them that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, it'll be our romantic comedy that we're never gonna write. Hey, did you like that? Did you like that? Yeah. Did you like it though? You want more? Don't want to work? Would rather watch videos of me grab assing with people? First of all, go up here to subscribe, and then go up here to uh, watch more clips. This is like when the weatherman says that there's a high pressure system coming in. Although I'm not really used to the green screen.